It's time for Your Voices of Hope, a video podcast program that offers straight talk on some of the major issues facing us today. Addiction, domestic violence, homelessness, human trafficking, and suicide. But more than that, it's our desire to inspire hope. Now, your host, Michelle Beyer. Welcome to Your Voices of Hope. I am your host, Michelle Beyer. Today, my guest is Kaylin Scarberry. She is the daughter of a recent guest that I interviewed, Julie Johnson. Sunday night, I got an email from Kaylin uh, telling me that I had interviewed her mom. And if you remember from that interview, her mom had an aha moment that helped her, you know, that's what got her sober. Her daughter was beaten by her husband, which was her daughter's father. And, um, Kaylin said to me that she wanted to help others um, because of what she went through. Her mom did not go into very much detail as what I feel Kaylin is going to go into. Um, and Kaylin, thank you very much for coming on to my show today. Um, why did you email me? Well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. But um, I emailed you because um, such a case like mine that I went through the sexual and physical abuse by my father, um, there's, there's not many places to reach out to to get help for people like me. Um, this is such a special case that I, I pretty much had to go through it alone. Um, I was able to talk to my mom and some of my family members but when it comes to a situation like that, there's only so much, you know, you can tell your family about things your father did to you. It's, it's very, very hard to not really having anybody to talk to, to explain what happened to me and the things that happened and how I was dealing with it. There's, there isn't anything like that out there right now for people like me. Okay. So and by the way, to everyone, I suggest you get some tissues. I, I have mine already because um, I have a feeling that this is really going to affect some of us. So if you do have some trauma, um, you know, if you have some issues, I, I, I'm going to warn you. This could be pretty intense. Um, Kaylin, how old were you? when this abuse started and was your was your mom still living with your dad at the time or did it start after she left so my parents actually got divorced when i was around three or four years old i was very young um but all of this really started um so my dad got custody of um me and my brother we both have the same parents um when I was in sixth grade and when he got first custody, um, it was a lot of mental abuse, like the things he would say to me, because of course, you know, nobody can prove anything of, like that while still in court. It was about five or six months later when things gradually started to get worse. Um, it would be like a backhand to the back of the head or, um, like a shove off the last couple stairs things like that. And just from there, it gradually got worse for um, about six, seven years. I dealt with all of that. Um, so the physical abuse started pretty early on, but it wasn't until about three years later when I really was um, developing, you know, growing into my maturity, that all the sexual abuse started. Um, and that continued up until my mom got custody of me and my brother again and when I was a uh, freshman in high school, when I was 14. So how old were you? The sexual abuse started when you were 14, 13? Um, probably about 10, 10, 11. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
did your mom know any of this? What was going on with your mom at the time? Is this when she was using? Yes. During this time, she was in active addiction. Um, so I didn't tell her any of this, not because she was in active addiction, but because I'm, I'm her daughter. You know, you can't really, it's, it's hard to walk up to your mom and, you know, let her know like, hey, not only is dad hurting me, he's doing these things to me that no father should ever, ever do to their daughter. And I felt ashamed. So for years, I, I said nothing. Like even with the beatings, I, because he was smart in the beginning, he knew how to play it off. It was um, punches in the stomach because I mean, I'm not skinny, I'm not fat, but I've always had body issues and he knew that. So he knew I would never pull my shirt up to show somebody the bruises on my stomach or wear pants short enough to show the bruises on my legs. Um, so it was really easy for me to hide it. And um, everybody found out about the physical abuse when I was um, a freshman when my mom got custody back. But I actually didn't end up telling anybody about the sexual abuse until October of, um, or not October, September of 2018 when, um, it finally got to be too much and I couldn't deal with it. Um, and I tried to commit suicide and I went into, um, Haven in, in Dayton. It's a behavioral health hospital. And I was there for about a week, um, trying to get back to myself. And that's when I disclosed everything. And part of my uh, recovery plan for myself was to tell my loved ones what happened and to hopefully start that healing process because I can't heal if nobody knows. When this started with your, I don't even want to call him your dad. Yeah, um, I don't. So whenever this started with whatever you want to call this piece of crap, and I'm sorry, don't that's me. what I would like to call him. Um, tell me what was going on. How did this, how did this come up? Tell me, tell me, just walk me through this. All right. So, um, I'm the oldest of my father's children. Um, he has me and then my little brother, Arnie, who's three years younger than me. So, um, when it started, it, it was more like, um, things like he would say, uh, I hate how much you act like your mom. I can't stand you look like your mom. Um, it, it's all about comparing me to my mom because as you've seen my mom, we look a lot alike. I am her mini her. I'm her clone. Yeah. So how things started, um, he was very upset about how close me and her were and how similar we were, things like that. Um, and then it got to Arnie and Arnie's my little brother um, because he is a clone of me. He would start saying things like that to Arnie and I knew things with him would. So at that point I became mom number two to my little brother. And, um, I, I never let him touch my brother. There was not a day that we were there that he ever laid a finger on my brother because I stepped in between. And that's where it started getting even more, more worse. If that makes sense. Um, because he didn't like one, I was sticking up for myself. I was sticking up for my mom and now I was taking care of my brother. So when I started doing that, he turned away from my brother and focused all of his attention on me. And um, it would be like whenever my brother would go to um, like his baseball practices and things, he would keep me back and uh, lock me in a closet for about six or seven hours and just leave me in there screaming and crying. And when I finally got out, it was a beating. Um, then I'd go back in and sit there until, uh, until everybody came back because at first he hid it from everybody, his wife, his wife's kid, and then, um, my brother. But after a while he stopped caring and his wife helped or what well, do you mean, what do you mean she helped? She'd hold me down. Um, put my hands behind my back so he could hit me or when the sexual abuse started, she would lock the doors and shut the windows and, um, make sure nobody could see anything. She would just kind of sit off to the side and make sure he got what he wanted. Yeah. She thought this was normal? 
she hated me about as much as he did because she didn't have a daughter. So she wanted one. And when I was so close to my mom and she knew that I would never be hers, she, she hated me. This is vile. Yeah. The day after they got custody of me and my brother, I used to have long, gorgeous hair all the way down to like almost my knees. And the day after they got custody, she made me cut my hair up to right above my ear because she had short hair and my hair looked like my mom. So there's obvious, um, obviously some serious mental illness. Well, there were, that goes without saying, but there's some mental illness going on, some severe stuff. Absolutely. So she's, she holds you down. She's condoning this behavior. Was he beating her? Not to my knowledge. Um, I know the one day that will always stick with me was um, the very first day that she actually started helping. Um, I was, of course, kicking, screaming, and crying. And she looked over at me and um, she said, this is what you get for not becoming mine and laughed. And it was, it was like an evil, evil queen laugh, like, <laughs> and just kind of turned away. And she, she was, she was happy. It was happening because she knew I was in vain. They both did. They laughed about it the entire time. And of course, once I was done, curled up in a ball, they just looked at me and spit on me. Oh my and called God. Crap, worthless. And you, yeah. you know, you're not worthless, right? I know, I absolutely know that now. I know my worth 100%. But back then it it was very hard. Because I mean, what what father does that to their daughter? I mean, I I just I just wanted him to love me. And I know I looked like my mom and I know I acted like my mom, but that's just my mom. Like you're still my dad, you know, you you shouldn't you shouldn't hate me this much. And even up until a couple months ago, I was willing to forgive him. And of course, I, I do forgive him for me because if I don't, I don't move on. But he, um, he tends to message me over Facebook every once in a while. And um, some days it would be okay. And then other days it was like, um, hey, I know you live here and here and you work here. I'm on my way to come see you and I'm pissed. So up until a couple months ago, he would text me off and on and continue to scare the living hell out of me um, until I finally told him enough is enough. You know, I, I, I'm not, I can't do it anymore because I always wanted a father's love. Cause I had my, but he's not my dad. You know, I, growing up, I never got father daughter dances. Um, I was really big into softball and I wanted my dad to go out and do batting practice with me and just things that a daughter gets with their father. And now it's looking towards my future and I'm not going to have a grandpa for my kids. Of course I do now because I have a wonderful stepfather. Yes. But before him, it was, I'm not going to have a grandpa for my kids. And I'm not going to have my dad to walk me down the aisle when I get married and give me away. And it's those things that I feel like every girl should have. And here I am missing out. So I try and try and try to be better, but none of it matters because I'm too much like my mom. He hates me that much. How, how often was this happening? Um, so the physical abuse was daily. There was no doubt. Some days were better than others when it was just like a shove down the stairs. Um, and then, of course, there were other days when it was full-blown fist fights and things like that. The sexual abuse was more, um, it was come and go. Some, some months it was quite a few times, like eight or nine times a month. Other months he just, he wasn't feeling it and he was just drunk all the time. So he didn't need me. Um, but it definitely happened way more often than it should have. It should never have happened. Yeah. yeah. I don't understand. You know, this is not something that you hear. Um, you, you, 
you, it's not that it's acceptable when it's a stepfather, but you hear it more with yeah. a stepfather because there is no blood relation. There's no, I, I mean, this is something that you just don't hear from a father with a blood relation. And I don't understand his thought process other than the fact that you do look and act like your mom and he still loves your mother. Yeah. Um, and as far as his wife goes, aside from her being a piece of crap, um, that, that if I was her, I would be jealous. I would be jealous that my husband is besides skeeved. We're putting that part, of, we're putting that aside. Yeah. I'd be jealous. I'd be very jealous that my husband wanted, forgetting the child, somebody else, you know? Um, did you ever think about running away? Wait, let's back that up for one second. And what about school? Did they ever see any of these bruises? Did you miss a lot of school? Um, no, I wasn't allowed to miss school um, because he knew that that would be, you know, a red flag to people. Um, it, the only time anybody saw it was my freshman year when he got stupid and was too drunk and hit Because like I said, it was normally my body. Um, he got me in my face and my entire left side of my face was black and blue and swollen. And I actually still to this day have a tiny, like you can feel it. It's like an indentation mark where this bone right here under my eye chipped and it, it just broke off and it's somewhere in there, but there's, there's a little chip in my eye, but no, didn't miss a whole lot of school. Um, nobody ever noticed because like I said, I had body issues, so I never showed anybody. Um, and I did try to run away. Um, not very often, but there were a couple times when I would grab my brother, say, come on, let's go, because I knew Springfield area so I could get around, but he had a car. So when he caught up to us, um, it was, it was a lot worse. It was, I was locked in that closet for two whole days. And then when I got out, I was knocked unconscious because he was so angry with me. I am sure as a mom that your mom just is devastated by this. And I would probably not recommend her watching this. Um, but, um, what kind of thoughts would go through your mind as, I mean, you're, you're a baby and he's doing these things to you, taking away your, your innocence. What kind of thoughts are going through your head? Um, the majority of it was, um, I was praying to tell God to tell my mom and my brother that I love them because I never thought that I would see the next morning. Um, I wrote a lot. I tried, I have a box of um, letters upstairs that not many people know about in my house. And it's every single letter that I wrote to my brother when I thought I would die. Because um, like I said, I, I became mommy number two. I raised him for all of those years. Um, so whenever... I had a night that I did not think I would make it through. I wrote him a letter to tell him how much I loved him, um, to make sure he ate breakfast in the morning, to make sure he took a shower and did his homework, and to tell him that um, I would always be there and that I love him, and to never forget that or never forget me, and that one day he would realize how much I loved him because he would see all the things that I did for him to protect him. Um, he actually doesn't know about that box. I never told him. Uh, it's, it's just a, bo a box of letters 
that I felt I needed to give to him to make sure if they found me the next morning that there would be a letter next to me for him so he knew I loved him. I'm sure he already knew that. I hope so. <laughs> where, where is your stepfather? I mean, where is your father and your stepmother now? Um, I would hope to God they were in prison, especially for this. I, I, I would rather say with Satan at the moment, but I don't think that's the case. Eventually no. that's where they'll be. Eventually. Yes. I, um, I have full belief that they will, um, they'll get what's coming to them. I don't have to do that though. God will let them know. But, um, they have both actually been to prison, but not for this. Um, both on separate occasions, uh, because when everything came out, um, first about the physical abuse, um, during the entire trials, it, it took a very long time because, um, the police officer, the first police officer that was on scene, um, told me I was an unruly child and I deserved it because she knew my stepmom. Um, so it took a while for that until, um, a man named Deputy Cole Tice came to my rescue and saved me. Every time I see him, I give him a big hug. Um, so it took a while for that because, of course, they believed the first officer on scene until Deputy Cole Tice came around. And then um, when everything did start coming to light, they didn't believe me. And once I finally told everybody about the sexual abuse, it was, like I said, in Haven. Um, and my stipulations to tell my therapist and my case manager was, I will tell you to heal for me, but not to go back to court because I lived in court so much. I didn't, I didn't want to go through it again. And I didn't want to reopen those wounds because I was not ready. So I told them that I will come clean and I will tell everybody that I need to, but the information is just for me to heal and goes nowhere else. Wow, this much adult behavior coming from a child amazes me. Um, also saddens me at the same time. Because your your whole childhood, your innocence was just ripped from you. Yeah. And um, do you ever, do you live with any kind of a, wow, I wish I could have, or any of those thoughts that I wish I could have done this and I wish I could have gotten to play on the swings and, and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, it still follows me to this day. Um, like in past relationships, um, actually the one I just recently got out of, um, we argued a lot because he said I needed to act more my age because I'm 21 years old, because everything that I did, it was focusing on bills and going to work and making sure everything was in line. Um, I didn't just get my paycheck on Friday and then go out to the bars or go spend it on stupid stuff because I was very meticulous in making sure that I could live the next month because it's always been my state of mind is, okay, I've got this, how can I make this last for the longest possible time? Because for the longest time, I never thought I'd make it another day. Um, and then I still find myself, which I'm getting better at it now with age, but I still find myself looking for a man's love. I, am, I was always hopping from relationship to relationship. I could not stay single more than two months. And here I am now. Uh, I've been single for a little over a year. And it's amazing. <laughs> I like being on my own. Um, but I'm, I, I wish there were times that I could act my age because I am very mature. I don't, I don't go out and have fun. I don't do a lot of things. Um, I definitely wish I could get some of that innocence back because I've been doing this for so long. It's, I, I don't know what to do to have fun. 
I just take care of things and I'm, I'm mom to everybody. Every single friend I have, they all come to me with their problems because I'm, I'm the mom of the group because I am so mature and it stinks. I mean, I like it because I can look out for myself and I can depend on myself, but it stinks because that's yeah. all I, I. Yeah, I would think it would. And do you see a therapist and, and. Not currently. Um, all of the therapists that I've gone to see, uh, they don't understand the situation. So when I try and talk to them about it, they don't really get it and don't have the best words to give me. So I, I tend to go this alone. I still deal with this by myself. Now today it's a lot easier than it was six years ago, but it's, it, I still have, I have PTSD, anxiety and depression. Um, so I still have my moments where I feel like my heart is racing and I, I go back to those times in the closet for two days and I get scared. Um, but it's a lot better than it was. But also now that my mom knows more, of course, I still keep some details to myself. Um, now that she knows more when I do have those times when I, I can't breathe and I get scared, I can tell her and either I'm on my way to her, or she's on her way to me. What details do you keep to yourself that you don't tell your mom if you don't mind sharing? Oh, no, it's okay. Um, the way he would go about um, sexually abusing me, um, it was a lot of the times uh, my, he would rip the button off my pants and um, like grab scissors while his um, – his wife would hold me down so I wouldn't move and get up and he would cut my pants off because I wouldn't work with him so he could get them off. Um, cut my pants off and then just like Hulk rip the rest of my clothes, my underwear, my shirts. Um, and I used to have little bite marks on my shoulders and I still have a couple scars there. Um, they're not very noticeable anymore, but um, when I would scream too much, he would bite to get me to be quiet, um, things like that, the more no mother wants to hear that from her daughter. So, no. yeah. No, no mother wants to hear that from anybody's daughter. No. Um, I just want to wrap you in my arms. <laughs> I feel it in my heart, I promise. And I'm really glad that you are single right now and you have been for a year. And that is something that I say to a lot of people because I'm a peer support specialist with lived experiences. I'm in recovery myself mm -hmm. and I have mental illness. Um, I've gone through a lot of stuff as well with uh younger years um but you have to learn to love yourself and you have to learn how to be with yourself absolutely so if you can't live with yourself how can anybody else live with you <laughs> yeah it took me a very long time to see that yeah. but we're getting there I'm, I'm starting to love myself again um i've been going to the gym well before they closed down, um, I was going to the gym. I was eating healthy. Um, I was starting to sing a lot more because I love singing. That's something me and my mom do together. Starting to sing a lot more, and I'm smiling, genuinely smiling, and it's not a mask, you know, because for a very long time I could smile and play it off like everything was okay. And now, I mean, of course I still have my days just like everybody else, but it's, it's genuine. It's not a mask anymore. And it feels good. Well, you should smile more because you have a very beautiful smile. Um, and I always look for a picture on Facebook of whoever I'm going to interview. So I could put that up like your mom. That mm -hmm. picture I posted was absolutely stunning. Well, I found one of you as well. Uh, 
and I love it with your glass, you had your glasses on in this one picture. And I love that picture. So I can't wait to put that up. Um, but you're a very beautiful, beautiful young lady. And, you know, someday you were going to find a man or actually he'll find you. And, you know, you'll live a life that you should live. But in the meantime, this is your time to find yourself. Yes. To do your healing and to have a lot of fun. You're, you, to discover what is fun for you. Right. You know, that's a whole new discovery because you have no idea what's yeah. fun. Now you know you like singing. Yes, I do. You also know that you can't go to a bar and do karaoke. <laughs> yes. Especially taking your mother. <laughs> right. That doesn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, so you've got to find other avenues, and, and that can be really difficult. Um, unfortunately, bars have a lot of fun things for people to do, like karaoke. Right. So um, finding ideas like a karaoke type of situation, getting some friends together and just having a great girls night, bad yes. singing, <laughs> <laughs> fun night would be awesome. And, you know, I'm sure there's a ton of things, you know, being silly, having sleepovers and just doing some silly, silly things, you know, oh, yeah. um, water balloon fights you know i i'm 53 and i would still have a water balloon fight you know? oh yeah great <laughs> you know so i i really hope that you can go back and just you're never going to recapture but that's okay because you're going to start over because that is the one thing about life is it's a do over Every day is a do-over. And you're here. You're getting a do-over. God I has you. I, I didn't think I would make it this far. So just being here today, having my own apartment, having a job I love, it's exciting. because. What do you do? Um, I'm an RA at a um, drug rehab facility. So uh, all the people that come in that are detoxing, going through withdrawals, things like that, I am there to help them through every step of the way. Why wouldn't you be there to help somebody? <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually waiting on my CDCA to come back. Um, I sent it to the state. They're waiting on my transcripts. And as soon as I have that, then I'll be moving up to a CDCA. I actually um, plan on being a therapist. That, that's the end game. It's going to take a lot of school and a lot of money, but that's my end game is being a therapist because of course, why not? It makes total sense. <laughs> it, it does. And, and you'll probably make a great therapist. I would imagine one geared towards children. Actually, um, I want to do mental health and addiction. Okay. Yep. Okay. So you said that there's not much help for, or any help. Um, for kids that have gone through what you've gone through and from the sound of it with the therapists that didn't know what to say to you, shame on them. Yeah. What kind of help would have, do you think would have been helpful for you? It, you sounds, know? it, it sounds kind of cheesy and cliche, but some kind of support group because I was so ashamed of myself for years because I thought it was my fault because I didn't hit hard enough. I didn't scream loud enough for somebody to come help me. Um, I thought it was my fault. So knowing that there were, if I would have known that there were other people that went through the same thing and I could talk to them and I could relate to them and know that my feelings were valid, that, you know, I wasn't just to screw up and it wasn't all my fault. You know, I feel like it would have been a lot easier, but that is not something that you come by at all. I have never once seen anything like that. And like I said, with the therapist, not knowing what to say, um, 
it's, it's like, a, it's a lone struggle because there's only so much you can tell people that don't understand the situation. Because I remember talking to one of my peers a couple of years ago and they said, I was telling them about everything. And just like my fear, they said, well, you must not have screamed loud enough for somebody else to hear you. <laughs> and I thought, and I was like, they have no idea what I went through. I told them, but they, they were listening, but they didn't hear me. Yeah. And it, knowing other people were out there like that, that we could have connected with and lifted each other up because I have the easiest time in the world lifting other people up. It's when it comes to somebody lifting me up that I struggle with. So if there would have been a group like that, you know, it, it, it would have helped. But I'm also in the midst of going to school and work. Um, I am, I have been trying to start up my own, um, I, I can't even think of the word, um, nonprofit. Okay. Uh, makeup actually was my coping skill. One, because I had to cover bruises and two, because it kind of got me away from everything. So uh, a nonprofit to teach children like me going through it, how to do makeup as like a little healthy habit to get away from the world for every, for those little moments when they need to. Okay. That's, that is, wow. I would have to agree that there isn't any help at all. Um, I know that when I was younger and I'm much older, we don't talk about it. We don't tell anybody. Um, and people don't believe it. Um, but yeah, you didn't scream loud enough. And that's because they never went through it. And they yep. have no idea that the louder you scream, the worse it's going to get. Yes. And for the most part, sometimes it's easier just to do nothing. And that's how it ended. Because but if you just let that go, it'll be over quicker. Yep. Um, I am just sitting here just trying to catch my breath. But I think that you're an amazing person. Um, and I think your mom is amazing. So your relationship with your mom, what is, what is that like? I mean, you said your mom in, in the email is your hero. Absolutely. She is my inspiration for everything. Um, because, you know, she dealt with the same man I did. And she came through it. And she was in her active addiction for 10 years and came back the most amazing mom. I ever could have asked for it. And I tell everybody, and I'm not anywhere close to ashamed, she is my best friend. I tell her every single thing now. Like, there, there's nothing that stays hidden between us. She, anytime anything happens, good or bad, she's the first person I call on the phone. Whenever I'm having a bad night, it's, I don't text any of my friends. I call her, you know, it. <laughs> It is the most amazing relationship I ever could have asked for because she is a mom and a best friend all in one and a dad too. I didn't need him. I just needed her. And she's everything all in one. I'm thankful that you at least have her in oh. your life. What about your brother? How, how is that relationship? We are really close. We butt heads a lot because um, I still tend to mother him a little bit, even though mom's back in the picture. Um, so I, I kind of have to check myself every once in a while doing that with him. But me and him are super close too. It, it, he's my baby. I love him. You know, he uh, was supposed to graduate high school this year, of course, with all the corona going around. He's missing that. But um, I'm so proud of him. Knowing that I am part of the reason he is the way he is today. Oh my goodness. 
it makes me so happy. Just I look at him and cry sometimes. That is so strange to hear a sister say that. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I'm not too sure a sister should be saying that. I don't know if that's wrong or right. Uh, I don't know either, but I, I just go with it. But you know what? It's a blessing in his case. <laughs> Um, because you, you pretty much saved him from your life. Oh yeah. Uh, so now your mom's getting married for yes. the third time. Third time's the charm. And that's what I said. <laughs> yes. That's what I said. Um, I to a wonderful man. Yes. I had an epiphany the other night because my favorite Bible verse is Joshua 1, 9. And it says, um, have I not commanded you? Do not be feared. Do not be dismayed for the Lord. Your God is with you wherever you go. And her fiance, fiance's name is Joshua. So it, it kind of hit me like, man, this is the right one. This is it. We got him hook, line and sinker. <laughs> and that is, that is amazing. You know, the whole family is just getting repaired and, you know, you're all young enough that you're just going to, you know, it's always said that um, the first part of your life, if it's that crappy, the rest of your life is amazing. Mm -hmm. and you are going to go on to do amazing things. And I really hope you now have my phone number, put it in your phone. I want to know. I want to keep you in my life. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I want to know what's going on. I, I want to see graduation pictures. I want to see the engagement pictures and marriage and all that great stuff. You're going to go on to do the most amazing things. And we are going to hear that Kaylin has done something for the whole community or whatever it's going to be, but it's going to be big. Oh, yeah. You will for sure. I know it. So, is there anything you would like to end this interview with telling people? It's hard and you're going to struggle. You're going to have bad days and days are going to feel like you just want them to end, but it is so worth it on the other side. There's not a day that I don't regret. Um, wanting to die because now that I'm through it and I'm on the other side and I see how amazing my life is, even though, like I said, I still have my days and I still struggle. It is one of the most amazing lives I ever, ever could have asked for, but make sure, even though it's hard, make sure you talk to somebody because suffering in silence is not, is, is not going to help talk to somebody reach out to me. Shoot. <laughs> we, we can be best buds. I'll, I'll talk to you day in and day out, but make sure you talk to somebody and get the help you need. And, and we can add your email address. Yes. Okay. So I'll make sure we add your email address to this video. Um, and I am for one, very happy that you did not complete your suicide. Me too. Um, I'm, I'm sure your mom obviously would feel the same way. So, because God's got his hand on you and, uh, and I think what you just said is, is amazing as well, because you know what, count to 30. If you have those, those thoughts that you want to hurt yourself and you want to end your life, count to 30. Call someone in those 30 seconds because seriously, it does get better. It can get better. It really can. I was there. I have an amazing life because it, it, it can get, it, it, it does. It goes away. All that stuff goes away. Yeah. It may so, take time, but it does. So thank you so much, Kaylin, for joining me today and reaching out to me. 
Thank you for having me. I loved it. And I hope somebody feels the same way I do at the joy I have in my heart right now. And it's shining right through you. I mean, the sun is shining today, yeah. uh, which is amazing. It's not snowing in May, thank God. <laughs> but it, your, your smile is beautiful. You're just beaming. And that is a beautiful thing. And you are absolutely beautiful. And I'm just, I'm, I'm privileged to be interviewing you today. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, and I want to thank all my guests for listening again today to another edition of Your Voices of Hope. And if you would like to be a guest on my show, please go to my website, yourvoicesofhope.com and scroll down to the bottom just like Kaylin did and fill out the form and email me and I will email you back. And um, I just want to leave everyone with this. Don't forget, love yourself. You are worth it. You've been listening to Your Voices of Hope with your host, Michelle Beyer. This podcast and earlier programs are available for viewing on our Facebook page, Your Voices of Hope, or our website, yourvoicesofhope.com. A new podcast is uploaded and ready to view every Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Keep your head up, keep your head up. You're not alone.